interrupt and then interject, you know, along the way. So if you have questions, feel free to just throw them out there. Um, I do want to say with the bio, I am no longer doing a lot of those things. So the unfortunately, the writers, UW Writers of Madison um, Division of Continuing Studies is no longer in existence. Um, it it uh, went out of existence last year, um, except I think the program is the writing program is good until June. And then after that, there won't be any more. So that's sad. And then I retired from the board of CWA and imprint um, to just focus on my writing. But I would love to talk to you about those organizations, particularly if you're a writer, um, CWA, I recommend joining, even if you live in Madison. I was on the board and I live in Madison. Um, so I can tell you more about that if you're interested. Um, but Patty wanted me to talk about how I became a writer. So um, I'll start there. I have been writing my whole life. Uh, since I was a little kid, I wrote stories, collected them in books, uh, wrote through school. And at the age of 12, I even submitted to the Saturday Evening Post and um, found the other day, I just discovered it, uh, wrote a short story that I submitted. Here's the, my mom typed it up on the typewriter and sent it out. So here's the little short story. It's called Perchance to Dream. Yes, I was a Shakespeare geek at a little young age. And even here's my little handwritten note that I'm sure my mom, because you can see the scribbles, typed up. And we sent it out. And here I got, I, I can't believe I still have this. I got the envelope, came back, typed on the envelope, and they had this, dear contributor, thank you for submitting the enclosed material to us. We indeed appreciate your interest and trust that you will continue to let us see your future work. So it was my first rejection letter at 12, <laughs> which was a while ago. And then I hadn't submitted anything for like another 40 years, but um, it, you know, it was fine. It was exciting just to get a letter back from them, um, which I thought was pretty cool at that age. So I wrote, and then in high school, I took what they then called college prep English. Now they, I guess they call it AP English or something like that. Um, I took my senior year English class and my uh, English teacher really uh, appreciated my writing and liked it and said, well, when are you going to write your first novel? And I thought, wow, I never thought about writing a book. That would be cool. Um, so I thought, well, maybe that's something I need to pursue. But I didn't know any professional writers. I didn't know any authors. Um, nobody in my family had pursued that, those professions. So I thought I need to become a journalist. That's the only way I can make money at writing. And luckily my high school, Madison Memorial had a semester of journalism that my senior year. So I took that and quickly found out that that was not something I wanted to do um, the, for two main reasons. So back then more so, much more so than today, it was very structured on how you could write when you were writing an article. So you had to have the who, what, where, when, why, and how in that first couple of paragraphs. There was no adjectives, there was no you know, uh, descriptions at all. It was just giving the bare facts. And I have always been a creative writer and that just seemed too limiting to me. I didn't want, I wanted to be able to write my own stuff. Um, the second reason I decided not to become a journalist was because I had to go up to strangers and ask them sometimes personal questions. And I um, was shy, more shy than I am now. And it really made me feel icky, just intrusive. And I didn't like that idea, which is kind of funny because now I'm exactly the opposite. I love talking to people. I'm fascinated by people. I wanna know everything about them. So I'm in line at the grocery store. I know everything about the clerk because I ask questions. Mm -hmm. But back then it just wasn't my thing. So I did not pursue in college. I got a, a psych degree and then my law degree and was a law librarian. But throughout all of that, I had to do lots of writing. Um, so I always was writing. And then um, I, after I had my first daughter, we moved from Boston back to Freeport, Illinois. And I stayed home because I homeschooled my daughters and I, I love that. And so I stayed home. But um, about that time when they were young, it was the Clinton years and it was during the Clinton impeachment trial. There was a woman who wrote a regular article for the Freeport Journal Standard. It, she was the local historian. So her columns were always really interesting to me. But then one of her columns, she decided to go political and I disagreed. So I wrote a letter to the editor disagreeing and I got fan mail, which was exciting. And then I also got a call from the competing newspaper called the Freeport Inc. saying, would I like to write a regular editorial column for them? 
And I said, well, what would I write about? She said, anything you want. And I said, okay, I'll do that. But like I said, um, I had my daughters at home and they were pretty young. And I, um, I don't know how typical this is, but it takes me a while to come up with ideas and to, I have, they have to germinate uh, before I really get to it. They wanted me to do a weekly column and it was too much. So I said, I'll do once a month. So I did that for about six years. And then also during that time, I submitted some articles to Home Education Magazine um, about my homeschooling, we unschool our kids. And those were um, accepted. So that was thrilling, super thrilling for me. But in the back of my mind was that idea of what about writing a book? And I thought, well, if I'm gonna write a book, what would it be about? And this was in 2007 and I was driving around in my car listening to Ray Bradbury's uh, Fahrenheit 451. And I thought if I was gonna write a book, you know, a lot of the books, novels, when they have uh, futuristic societies, the societies are dystopian or evil. And I thought, what if I wrote a book about a society that's an improvement over what our society is? And so what would that be for me? And that would be an unschooling town. So unschooling is a form of homeschooling. And that's what we did. It's a, it's a way of living with our children. Unschooling is where the child determines their own education. They determine when and how and why they're, you know, how they're gonna go about learning, what it is they're gonna learn. And the parents act as facilitators, um, making sure they have the resources they need and opportunities. And so I envisioned a whole town of unschoolers, then that would be perfect. And so that's how I came up with the idea uh, for Carpe Diem, Illinois. And at the same time, soon after there was um, a workshop on how to write a novel, one day workshop, which is pretty amazing, um, in just one day. Um, and it was at Rock Valley Community College. And so I thought, well, I'll give it a try. You know, now I have an idea, why don't I try it? So I went and the woman that ran it became a good friend. She was the vice president of the Rockford Writers Guild, which has been around since the 1940s. And she invited me to come to that. And then she also, as vice president, one of the things that she um, ran was the critique groups. Uh, she didn't run them, but she helped people get together to set up their own groups. And she was setting up a group. So she invited me into her critique group and uh, there were six women. And so we were gonna meet January of 2008. And we had to come with our first chapter. We were all writing novels, different genres, all different genres, um, but all writing novels. I had never written a chapter of a book in my life. I had written, of course, short stories and then longer nonfiction pieces, but never. I mean, it was, you know, how do you, and you know, when you think about this, especially for you readers that aren't writers, where do you put the comma in, you know, is it, does it go before the quotation mark or after it? And then when you say, he said, is the he capitalized? I mean, all these things, little things that I had no clue about, you know, despite the fact that I had nothing to know how to write a book about anybody. Um, but I did it, I was really thrilled. And we went and it was very nerve wracking because I only knew one woman. Um, I had met one of the other women, I didn't know her as well. And then I didn't know the other ladies. So to come and read my pages out loud was very um, nerve wracking, but I did it and I was very pleased. Um, their comment was, you seem to know a lot about homeschooling, um, which was true. At that point, I think I'd been homeschooling for 15 years. I have two daughters and I had helped out at, they had a huge conference in Chicago every year and I helped out there. Um, and then I helped found a couple support groups and had written those articles for the home education magazine. So I knew a lot about it. And I said, you know, I don't want to for a couple of reasons. Um, at that time, even back then, there were a lot of homeschool how-to books, including some on unschooling. And so I didn't know if I would uh, be able to add anything to it. Um, but the other reason was I wanted people um, to understand that unschooling is, an, is a viable alternative. And I wanted it to get to the broader public, not just to homeschoolers, um, to anybody who was interested in, in education at all. So um, I thought novel, writing a novel would be the best way to go about that. So I continued with writing it, uh, the critique group. If you're a writer, I recommend critique groups. Um, we met once a month. Um, our group was called Chicks of the Trade, which was awesome. Um, we met once a month and then we finally realized it wasn't enough. So we met every three weeks. And because of that, I had to get these chapters to them. I had to be accountable to the group 
and it got me to get the writing done. Um, after about a year, I realized I needed to go to some workshops. I needed to learn, you know, from some professionals. So I signed up for UW Madison Division of Continuing Studies right by the lake. Um, that first, that was my first year in 2009. And I had about 16 chapters and there was, it was a beginning novel writing course taught by Christine DeSmit, um, who's amazing. And there were 14 in the class. Um, it was a, an amazing class. Some people just had ideas for writing and others um, had some chapters, but I was the one that had the most completed at that point. And I'll never forget the first day she had said, Christine said, you have to write what you love. And that's what I tell people today. There's this big discussion about, should you write what you know or not? You know, there's a big, that's kind of going on right now. And I say, well, first you've got to write what you love for that first book. Because on average, a book takes, your first book takes five years to write. So if you're not loving that subject, I mean, it might be something you're just interested in, but if you lose interest in it because you don't love it, you, you may not finish the book. They say about 99% of people who start a book never finish it. Um, so then there's a reason, you know, it's, it takes, it's a huge process. It's a long, it's, it takes a lot of time. Um, so I, she said, write what you love. The second day I went to class, um, we had to bring in a synopsis of our book. So I read my synopsis about unschooling and homeschooling. And one of the women in the group said, um, I've been a school teacher for 23 years. So basically what you've said um, I've been doing for 23 years is just a bunch of crap. <laughs> and I was like, no, that's not what I meant. You know, and obviously I needed to hear that because she was offended in some way by what I was saying. And, you know, that's like the last thing a novelist wants to do is really offend people. Um, you might want to, you know, perk their interest, but you don't want to offend her. Um, the funny thing is she's a good friend of mine today. Um, so she doesn't remember the conversation, but I certainly do. And it led to more discussion about the premise of my book and whether it's even saleable. And it didn't, people agreed that they probably wouldn't read something like that. I went home crushed. I thought, that's it. I spent 16 months working on this book and wasted my time. And I was going to quit the class and I don't know about writing anymore. And I vented to my daughter and my mom. And at the time, the big book that came out was Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. And I thought, well, heck, if he can take on the Catholic Church, I can take on public schooling, right? I mean, he did it. So I thought, I'm going to go back to class. I'm going to get there early. I'm going to say that to her and give it a try. Give it one more day. So I did. I went up to Christine. She's writing on the board. Um, and I started to tell her that. And she said, shh, sit down. I was like, oh, OK. So I went and sat down. And then she brought it up. She said exactly that. She said, first of all, again, you have to write what you love. And obviously, I love this topic. Um, it really is important to me. So that's good. But second of all, how did Dan Brown do that? How did he, he tackle controversial issue? And, you know, a lot of novels do that. Um, it's something that I really love to do. I like the deeper issues in my novels. And so she said the way he did, she, he did it was he had a protagonist who was knowledgeable but neutral on the subject. Um, Robert Langdon knows a bit about um, the whole, you know, codes and all this thing, but he, he didn't know a lot about the supposed idea that Jesus was married, that was new to him. And, and so he was exploring that along with the reader. Sorry if I spoiled the book for you. Um, hopefully you read it by now. Anyway, so she said, that's what I needed in my book. At that time, uh, Carpe Diem itself was the main character. I had a secondary character named Leo Townsend and he was a journalist. So it made sense just to elevate him to the protagonist. Um, so that's what I did, yeah. And um, the thing about Leo is, um, there's a couple of things about Leo actually. Um, he started out um, very, he's very attractive, first of all. So I don't know if anybody knows uh, Rodrigo Santoro. He's the number one Brazilian actor, um, I think still, even since then. He's very, very attractive. He's been in a couple of American movies. He was, if anybody has seen Love Actually, um, he was um, Laura Linney's love interest in that. And he was Cersei's in 300 and he's been in a couple of things. But that's how I picture um, Leo, this is just very attractive, tall, he's 6'3", thin, you know, um, darker. Um, anyway, and he was very, um, 
he had a drinking problem and he was a womanizer and he was very two dimensional. And I knew that when I was writing the second draft of the book, I thought there's not enough to him here. He doesn't have enough substance. And so there are tricks uh, or, or you know, exercises that writers can do uh, to help deep, dig a little deeper. And one of them is to interview your characters. So I did. So I sat down, I used my laptop. I don't write by hand um, for a couple of reasons. My um, brain works faster than I can write and nobody would be, including me, be able to read what I wrote if I was trying to scribble too fast. Um, and my hand cramps up. So I type pretty fast. And so I do everything pretty much on my computer. And I wrote down and I started asking him questions. And the first question is, you know, how are you today, Leo? Cause I didn't know where to start. And he's, he was pissed, he was mad, he was hungover. So he was not in the mood to be interviewed. And that's how the whole thing went. It's a very much of a stream of consciousness thing. And by the end, I realized that Leo was a triathlete. Now I, I like to walk, but I have no aspirations to being a triathlete. I don't know a lot about it, but he was a triathlete and it just came out. And I remember going to my, my daughters and saying, um, oh my gosh, Leo is a triathlete. And they I, I said, I didn't, I didn't know this. And they said, mom, how could you not know this? You wrote him. And I can't explain it. It's just the way it is. And what's interesting too, is that's a huge, plays a huge part in the first book and the second book, and it'll play an even bigger part in the third book. Um, so that helped to develop him a little bit more as a character, which was a lot of fun, yeah. So the synopsis of the book, not to slow me down if you got questions. I don't know, how are we doing, Patty? Okay. Yeah, good, good, yeah. Going, okay. I, I mean, I'm listening. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, I can't see your faces, so I, I'm just, you know. Anyway, um, so, yeah, so I had this character. Um, and so the premise of the story is he is down on his luck. He has, um, there's been things that have happened to him and things that he has done that has caused this. And so he is given just one last chance to redeem himself. And um, his editor likes him and wants to give him this chance. And the chance is to write about this small town that has no schools. He thinks, well, I don't want to write that. I write front page news. That's going to be a fluff piece in the education section. Nobody's going to care. I don't care. Why do I want to write this? And so while he's um, thinking all these things, uh, there's a, in the, in the um, newsroom there in one of the monitors, this news story comes on saying that a man has driven his motorcycle into the car of a woman. And the woman happens to be the state senator of uh, the wife of a state senator in Illinois. And the man who drove the motorcycle is the son of the founder of this little town. The woman's husband is trying to outlaw homeschooling in the town, in the, in the whole state. So Leo's thinking there's something going on with this little town, I'm gonna go investigate. So that gets him into the town to check things out. Um, yeah, and so he became, my character who was knew nothing. He's not married, he doesn't have kids. He never homeschooled. He vaguely knew about homeschooling. Um, so he knew nothing about it and was neutral. He didn't, you know, either way he didn't care about it. So that's how that story developed. Yeah, yeah. Sounds interesting. So is, are the three books, is that final? I mean, is it, does it end after the third book then? The, the story or is it continued? Well, yeah, that's a good question. So when, the, when I finished the first book, I, I just assumed it was going to be um, just one book when I was, I was writing it. And um, the best piece of advice I give to first time novelist is just to finish the book. Um, you don't know how it's going to start until you finish it, which sounds really weird. But a lot of times people will work on that first chapter over and over and over again. If you get to the end of the book, when I should say you get to the end of the book, you may have to rewrite it anyway. So just keep plugging through. When I finished the first draft of this, I realized he had more stories to tell. I didn't know it was gonna be a series at all until that last sentence. So then um, I worked on God on Mayhem Street um, almost the same time that I was working on the publishing aspects of this book. Um, and then what happened with God on Mayhem Street was I like, a lot of plot twists, um, just something fun for me. These are kind of like suspense thrillers. And I had sent the, I think it was the second draft to my critique group and my editor. And they both, all of them said, 
this is two books. You've written so much that there's two, there's two books. And it was, I remember it was right before Thanksgiving and I was upset because I thought it just, it was really well formed. And then I thought, well, that's dumb. It's great. It's two books, right? You've got another whole book there. So I took out um, writers talk about not pages, but by word count. So if you figure 250 words per page, four pages would be like a thousand words. So I took out 30,000 words out of that book and it's sitting there waiting for the third book. Um, and then I have ideas for at least a prequel and possibly another one. So, but what happened was, so I, um, I was the a founding, mem a founding member and president of Inprint in Rockford, Illinois, which was a wonderful writer's organization. And we had, well, among other things, we had a prompt club and the prompt club would get together. We would um, decide on what our prompt would be for the next month. And uh, the prompts always had to be a thousand words or less. And that particular month they said, pick out a photograph and then write about it. So I picked the, I don't know why, but I picked the mushroom cloud from the atom bomb. And I wrote a short story called The Bomb. And that character just blew me away. <laughs> just blew me away. Um, he was great. He was just really great. And I couldn't stop thinking about him. So I've put Leo aside and he's very mad at me for this, but I put him aside for the time being. And I'm working on a young adult thriller, um, kind of a dystopian, a dystopian, which is funny too. Um, and it's a, it's going to be a four book series. Um, it was going to be a trilogy, but again, we divided the, my editor and I divided the first book into two. It's called The Devil Particle. And it's really, fun. it's been really hard. It's the hardest thing I've had to write. It's been really fun though, too. The premise is that they've discovered that evil is a, there's a, it's a known quantity and they can collect it from people, extract it from everybody, and then contain it. And they have to contain it into one person and it has to be a, teen, a 17 year old. So yeah, so it's been really fun. That's a whole nother. Wow time I can talk to you about that because the research and stuff has been really fun with that one too yeah mm -hmm. so that's what I'm currently currently working on Leo's on the Leo's you know off the wayside and when I get back to him it'll be a relief because this these books have been tough tough to yeah. write but the, the uh it, it sounds interesting because your characters become your imaginary friends yes yes with the authors I, I've noticed that you you have a personal uh, relationship with them and yeah. Uh, you know, you had to put Leo aside. Leo was mad. I mean, it's just interesting how that, that happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then um, he's actually, I, you know, of course I adore him. My mom often asks us if I'm in love with Leo, um, maybe a little bit, but my, <laughs> my favorite character in the books is Patrick um, Holden, who's in the first chapter. He's actually my favorite. He was the easiest for me to read because I instantly he, he came fully formed in my head, which is, is kind of fun. What's also interesting is in the, the first book, the villain started out to be a man. His name was Richard Stebbins. And it took a while to find, figure out his name. And then I realized, no, because of who Leo is, it had to be a woman. And so it took a while, and I have her fully formed, but her name too is Reagan Collier. And I wanted it to be a little evil sounding, but not too um, soap opera-y. So I hope I, you know, that took a while to figure out the names, but some names also like Leo's name came to me immediately. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's Leo Townsend, which it was like the third or fourth draft of the book before I realized it's Townsend. So he was sent to the town or the town sent for him. I didn't realize that that's how my brain had worked. It just, I know, yeah, yeah. And he's in the, in the second book, um, he is, so he also goes to a small town. He is in the midst of interviewing the front running presidential candidate who is openly gay, which um, even back then that we knew people who were running for president that were gay, but this man is gonna win. Uh, he ha he's hands down, he's gonna, he's gonna win. And so Leo has this interview of a lifetime with this man in Chicago. And just as they sit down to you know, start the interview, Leo gets a call from his brother that his estranged father has suffered a near fatal heart attack. And Leo has to rush to the family farm in Endeavor, Wisconsin um, to be with them and take over the farm. And so Leo does, 
um, the village president of the town is the villain and, and he's also homophobic. So um, the presidential candidate, for reasons you find out, decides to come to the town and grant the interview. So that's when there's all kinds of the trouble happening. Yeah, yeah. Sounds fascinating. That really does a complicated story, you know. Right, one right. Happening. Well, and then what's fun too, and maybe um, people who are watching. Um, so that you know, I had this. I, I had my publisher is Little Creek Press in Mineral Point, Wisconsin, and I don't know if you heard, but I I selected her because her covers are just beautiful. I really loved her covers, and so when I was doing some research um, for the second book, I stopped in a town to take. I had an idea of how I wanted the second cover to look. And so I stopped at a town and this is actually my photograph and my editor, my publisher then took out street signs and stuff. So you can't, um, you know, see just from the signs what town is, but I, we can maybe let people look at it a while and figure out if they can, it's a Wisconsin town. It's not too far from Wanakee actually. Um, I think I know what it is. Okay. Baraboo? Nope. Mm -mm. <laughs> nope. Okay. That'll be a, that'll be a 50 Yes, right. <laughs> how, how will you tell us once we... Well, just let me know at the end. Right? Okay. I'll, I'll let you know. So All take right. a good luck, you know, people. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a really sweet town. So, yeah, and yeah, you probably are all familiar with it. Okay. We'll have to... so, so talk a little bit about um, how you got... You, your books are on audiobook now. They are. Yes. So that, yeah, that oh, was... That's right. Right. So um, right after I published the first book, I thought, oh my gosh, I would love to have these read. How exciting would that be to hear these characters come alive like that? And um, I wanted to have an American Players Theater actor because I, we kind of, uh, my family has kind of grown up with American Players Theater. I actually, my mom and I, when they first opened, um, went there and planted seeds um, when I was a teenager. Um, so when they way back when they first started, and then my daughters have both been in their acting camps and have ushered and my parents donated money to their costume designs um, stuff. So we were really involved in it. And we just love that place. Uh, so I thought, well, ideally, in a, in a perfect world, that's what I would have one of those actors read my book. But I didn't see how that was possible, because I don't have a recording studio in my basement or anything like that. And a lot of um, writers will go through, Amazon has a, a, a program called ACX and it's, it's, it works really well. You can go online and you can audition um, readers, uh, actors for your part, your book and then hire them and work out everything. And I knew people who had done that, but I, as I said, I really wanted an American Players Theater actor. So I um, was at a book fair, an author book fair and the woman that ran it, um, Christine um, Kalani, she, said that she had her books out on display and she had several CDs of her books. And I said, did you get those through Amazon? She said, no, actually I did that locally through Paradigm Productions in Madison on West Washington, although they've moved now. Um, and I said, really? So I went and called them and then I got a tour and decided to go with them. And then I contacted, um, David Daniel at American Players Theater and um, tried to try to nail him down, but he was incredibly busy because he also, in addition to being the core company, he runs all the education program and the and the camps. So he's really busy. And then I talked to James Ridge and he um, was really interested, but then he's he within a week or so, he was waiting to hear about a, a role that he was might be getting, which he got. So I contacted um, the artistic director and I asked her, I said, can I just send an email blast to the cast, the whole staff, um, acting staff? And she said, well, yes, you can, but there is this young actor who wasn't at APT this year, he's up in Door County acting and he'll be done in the beginning, end of, beginning of August, I guess it was. His name is Rob Doyle and here's his information. So I contacted him and he was completely excited about the idea. He thought that'd be really fun. So we met at Paradigm Productions um, and they have um, setup is really something. So there's the 
I guess it's like the little studio area. There's a couch and then the engineer sits with his boards. I mean, it's just amazing. And he was a young man named Justin who was awesome too. And then there's a soundproof roof that the actor sits in and it's really like a closet space. And there's a window in the door so we can see him. And we had the best time. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. Um, one of the best experiences I've had in my life. It was really fun. So I had, um, I was telling Patty, this is my, I mean, my, my books don't generally look this beat up, <laughs> but um, this is my copy when the books came, when they were published and I got the boxes, I opened it up and this is the first one I saw and I hugged it because, oh my gosh, I wrote this. And then I, in the inside, I wrote mine. So this is mine. And this is the one I use for readings. Um, you know, I make notes in it. And then when I was sitting there listening to the actor, to Rob, read, I would make little notations in it, um, like if he missed a word or if I wanted him to say it a little differently. Um, so it's, you know, kind of a treasured copy um, that I have. But yeah, so we did that. And then um, how sometimes these things work, Rob and a business partner were um, developing a theater in Spring Green. So I don't know for those of you that like to go out that way, there's a second theater in Spring Green. It's um, the call, it's in the building called the Jefferson. The theater is Two Crows. And they have a, it, the Jefferson is right on the main drag. If you're familiar with Spring Green, it's across from, I think it's Freddy's. It's the big um, restaurant that was the bank. It's right across the street. And it's a black box, small theater in the back. And the front is a bar area, really nice, like a speakeasy. Um, and they offer plays in the winter months. So American players, actors will perform the ones that are still in the area will perform there. Uh, one woman plays and up to three or four actors for other plays, they have three plays. It's, a, it's an amazing setup. They were just opening. So I said to him, you know, when the audiobooks come out, I'll have the book release party there. So we did, it was wonderful. We had a really good time, a good turnout and everything else. So it, yeah, it was really something. And he did, it's funny. So the books are on CD. Um, which I'm going to uh, give Patty a couple of for the library, we'll have some, but you can also listen to, you can get up through Audible and other, you know, if you do your phone, if you like to listen to books. But um, when it came out, I had to listen to it, of course, to make sure it sounded the way I like. And I thought, you know, I know this book so well. It's had how many drafts of writing. And then we sat and he read it and we went over and we edited as he's going. And, you know, I'm going to be so bored listening to this for the umpteenth time. I couldn't stop listening to it. I mean, he did a really good job. And then what was amazing, he did all these, all the voices. Um, and so we were in the second book and I thought, I want, I want, as we go, I'm going to count all the different voices. So not just the main characters, but like if there's a waiter or something, right? There were 40 some different voices in this book. So then I thought I'm going to go back and count in the first book, thinking that it's going to be like 30. There was over 70 different voices that he did. It was unbelievable. And there was one scene in, the, in this book, there's a teenage uh, public school girl comes into the town. Her mom is the, the woman that's in the car accident. So she comes and there's a hospital in Carpe Diem. So she comes to be with her mom. And so you've got her pers public school perspective. So she's with her mom and she's with her dad. And then this, this elderly gentleman, I think pretty sure that's the scene. And I'm listening to Rob doing this dialogue between these three people with completely different voices. And I'm looking in the window saying, how many people are in this room? How can you? And he explained it to me later. He's like, well, I'm trained. And then, I, but yes, but what does that mean? And so, you know, the voice is up here and down here. I, and then how do you remember that voice? You know, it's just, it was just amazing to me. Yeah, really something. It yeah. really is an art to read a book like that. I've just, it, it's just, you, they, you almost feel like they're schizophrenic. Yes, exactly. Because they can they can do all these different characters. It's right, right. And he had to speak Italian. So um, in the second book, in particular, he had to speak some Italian because Leo's mom is from Italy. So there's some Italian phrases. So you know that was fun too. Oh, and then the first book, um, I like music. I'm not a musician. My both my daughters are musicians, but I'm not. It kind of skipped over me. But I love music. Um, you know, it's just a big part of of 
what I like to have around me. And so there's a lot of music in these books, um, a lot of reference to music, um, especially the first, if you wanted me to read the first chapter, I can read that. Um, so there's, he had to sing a little bit too, and sometimes too. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Yeah. And he had a great time. They don't, a APT actors are so busy, they don't normally do this. And so when he would go back into Spring Green, they were all like, so how was it? What did you do? How did, you know, the, cause they were thrilled. And so, and a couple of them, like Jimmy DeVita is like, you know, we were talking about, he could be the villain in the second book. And he like, yeah, I could, you know, and so, you know, I got that whole, I'd have Rob do my, my new series all over again. I would definitely have. Yeah. I, it, uh, I, that's a plug for audiobooks. I just gotten hooked on them. I have an audio book going all the time and a regular book. It's just me too. Incredible. I yeah. love them. Especially if you have a great reader like that. Yes, to, uh, for a great reader. So great, great. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. What else was I going to ask you about? Um, oh, where can you where can you purchase your books? So you said um, uh, we have them at the library if they'd like to check them out. But also, yeah. if you'd like to purchase them, usually, if we had you in person, you could sell your books and then sign them, and people could walk away with them signed. But that's not going to happen on a Zoom presentation. So go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can get them at Mystery to Me Bookstore in Madison. Mm -hmm. And Barnes and Noble has them. And then, of course, you can get them online, too. Yeah. There's a new bookstore in Verona. I don't live that far from Verona um, called Kismet Books. Just open like mm -hmm. the last couple of months. And I haven't been over there yet. But I'll, I'll get over there and see if they're interested in having some of my books there, too. Um, mm -hmm. So you can get it locally or you can, you know, through Amazon either way yeah and then right now if you do kindle um they're only 99 cents on kimble kindle so if you don't if you like to do the e-readers yeah i've got a special going on right now is that for audiobooks too no audiobooks you no, can that's just reading on the machine you know the, yeah yeah just that ebook yeah okay yeah, yeah um i think you had asked me to talk about my writing process i don't know if people are interested in that um sure, yeah, sure. okay guess so, okay. yeah okay um I find that it, it um, changes a lot. It's changed um, a lot over the years. And I, I keep trying different techniques to see what works for me. Um, last year, it was really, really hard to be creative. And I heard that from a lot of creative people. It was just hard to get to it. And so I gave myself a break. Um, I did a lot of reading, which is also part of my process. Um, and, and, you know, just, just kind of taking a break from it. I did get some work done, but not as much as I normally do. Hmm. And so the beginning of this year, um, you know, New Year's resolution, here we go. Um, I thought, why don't I start a new program for myself? And so I call it two by two by two. So two hours of writing, two hours of marketing, and then two hours of reading every day. Um, and it, it started out really well. I did the, the writing really well and I did the marketing really well. This is considered marketing for me, you know, um, or answering emails too is part of that. But the reading was hard because I don't know how the rest of you feel. You're, I'm sure you're all readers. Um, it's, it's indulgent for me to read, just to set aside time. I feel like I should be doing the dishes or, you know, changing the sheets or whatever. And so it was hard for me to just say, no, this is part of my job. This is really important for me to read great literature. That's how I learned to write better. Um, but yeah, so I was doing really well with that. And then I got sciatica. I don't know if anybody's had sciatica. I never had it before. Oh my God, that's really painful. <laughs> and so I could sit for maybe half an hour. Um, sometimes I'd force myself for an hour, but then that was it. I just couldn't get, I couldn't, it was just too painful. I got some stuff done almost every day. So it was um, I'm working with my editor now is Tim Storm, who lives in Madison. He was a, a high school English teacher for a long time and now teaches adults um, in all kinds of programs. He is absolutely an amazing editor uh, because not only is he editing my stuff, he's, he's teaching me how to be a better writer. So um, there's, a, there's a couple of different editors that you, editorial processes you go through, a book goes through, and the First one is a developmental edit. And that's where the editor looks at the story structure, the characters, the plot, the pacing, all of those important things, and then um, helps you develop those better. And so he, and then there's a um, 
it's the line edit it's called, but that's like a copy editor where they're going through the grammar and the word choice that comes at towards the end. But developmental is as you're revising, making sure that if there's consistency that your character didn't have brown hair at the beginning and blue hair at the end or something, unless, you know, as part of the story, um, but also how the character changes throughout, how the plot is progressing, all of those things. So he has been helping me with that. Um, as I said, these are difficult books. I've got there's four of them, and each one of them will have a different kind of character arc. Um, it just happened uh, naturally. I'm um, a pantser as opposed to a plotter. Um, I write by the seat of my pants. Um, I don't know what's going to happen until it comes out. I'm now kind of hybrid writer because pantsing um, takes a lot longer than plotting does. Plotting, then you're figuring out the bones of the structure of the story. Um, that's not necessarily set in goal, you know, it's, you can, you can be flexible about it, but it gives you some outline of how the story is going. I now do a little bit of both. Um, with my first two books, I didn't at all. But as I'm writing this, I've realized these character arcs are going to each be different for each character. So he had been helping me. Um, I could send him an email. We emailed back and forth. I would send him some structures, outlines and things like that, but I wasn't really doing, getting to the work as much the six hours I couldn't I couldn't manage that so I'm feeling better now yay and I'm slowly getting back into that regiment uh, I haven't decided uh, mornings um, are a good time for writers because if you can you know do it earlier in the morning you're not interrupted by life and people and phone calls and everything else that goes on um, when I wrote my first book in particular, I would get up at, and I'm not a morning person, I would get up at 6 a.m. and write till 7.30 before my daughters got up. Uh, and that really helped me to get the book done. So now I try to write from eight to 10, but I'm finding that I'm actually more creative in the afternoons. The words just flow better. It's, I just seem to write better in the afternoon. So I, I'm, I'm kind of fitting my writing in where it works best for my schedule and still trying to figure that out. But my goal is, so the first book is, in the seventh draft and I've got um, going to finish that and then write it, go another draft and get that to my editor. Um, he's not available till June, which is okay because then I can get that done and work on the, the second book and the third book and the fourth book. And I want to get them pretty sure I'm going to, I'm going to publish them myself and we can get into that if you want to a little bit why my reasons behind that, but I would like to have them all pretty well completed before the first one comes out so that every four to six months, the next book can come out right after. Because these are the new series. It is basically one book divided into four. I mean, the Leo books, um, they're all Leo in each one and some of the same characters, but he, he's individual stories in each one. So you could read the second book without having read the first and still know what's going on. The, the series that I'm working on, you'd be hard pressed to, you know, to understand really. You, it's like the Hunger Games or Harry Potter or something like that, where you really should start from the beginning of the series to read on. So that's what's important to get them out, you know, pretty quickly one after the other. Yeah, that's my plan. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you've got an ambitious uh, uh, next couple of months. I do, yes, yes, which is good, yes. yes. Um, do you write at home? Then you I have do, an office. Well, I do now. Um, I, I, I'm lucky I can write anywhere. Uh, so when my daughters, I was homeschooling my daughters and you know, the one had art classes, I would drive her to the art class and I'd go to the library or a coffee shop or my other daughter had music class or whatever. I could pretty much write anywhere. Um, my favorite place um, to write on earth is at the Union Terrace, but that was closed last year. And then the Breeks in, in Madison, there's a Breeks coffee shop. There's several of them throughout Madison. Um, and then there's a couple other coffee shops that I would like to meet writer friends. And so we would get together and discuss, you know, life in general, but also then our, our current projects and maybe pick the brains of each other and then have lunch and then just write. And so I'm looking forward to getting back to that because I'm missing that. We've done a couple of virtual things like that, but it's just, it's just not the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think we're all trying, we're all, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel as we get vaccinated and you know things are the weather's getting better so it's just going to be uh you know we're all looking forward to me too i just yeah 
it's going to be, it'll, it'll be fine, but yes. So, um, mostly at home lately, but yeah. looking to getting out. And yeah, getting coffee, out. coffee shops are a good place to get your juices going, you know, just, yeah. And I like the, I find that I do like the noise. The, um, yeah. The hubbub I have to be by windows. I, you know, so I'm thinking of an idea. I like to have a view. Mm -hmm. I have friends that have to be in like a basement room with no windows or the windows blinds are closed and the doors closed mm -hmm. and they have, you know, the earphones with the sound, no sound. I mean, they, they can't, they're just easily distracted. Mm -hmm. I would go crazy like that. So mm -hmm. it's just interesting, but then I can't, I can't listen to music while I write at all. I can't, it, that just is too distracting, but I, the, the background noises work really well for me. Yeah. Yeah. So great. Well, this has been fascinating. I really, you've got such so many interesting uh, sides to your, your writing and your experiences and just the plots are sound just really uh, complicated, but um easy in I mean the books are not that that long so it's an easy enough book to get through you know I, yeah I'm kind of a right reader if it's 400 pages I'm good but if it's any more than that I think having it in, I am uh, currently reading Gone with the Wind I have never oh. read Gone with the Wind but it's you know over a thousand pages yeah. <laughs> and I'm a slow reader I'm a very slow reader yeah, so I'm a slow reader. time Good. Well, it's 720 and um, I was just wanted to open this up for questions. Uh, we I noticed we have some writers in the group, so oh, I don't know if, uh, if any of the writers have questions or if anybody has questions. You you uh, explained a lot of things, so maybe um, we don't. But are there any questions? If you want to unmute yourself, you could ask a question. Otherwise, um, or, ch or uh, you know, put something in the chat. That would be OK, too. OK. Oh, Rex Owen. Hi, Rex. How are you? Nice How are you? you? Good. How's your going? One, one thing I've been, you know, as we're trying to still stay connected, all of us, um, did you find your writing during the pandemic, especially last year, was it affected in any way? Yeah, quite a bit. It was hard to write. It was hard for me to be creative at all. Um, so I did other things I read mostly. Um, I did write when I felt like it, but I just, I had to let it go. It was just, it's not gonna happen. How about you? It, it, exactly the same thing. I, um, I was working on my, still am working on my fourth novel. And because I had more time, I wrote a lot more and wrote a lot faster. So my, my initial draft was much larger than I wanted it to be. But then after I got done with that first draft, I gave myself a month off and I went back and read it. And I said to myself, oh, what a vanilla book. Who's <laughs> gonna read this? Oh, no. <laughs> I was completely, completely dissatisfied with myself. Yeah, so but, it goes, right? But then you had something to work on, right? I mean, you oh, yeah, started, right. Which yeah. is nice, yeah. Um, so I belong to a group in Madison of women writers called Writers Must Eat. And um, yeah, which is awesome. We get together every other month um, for two hours for lunch from noon to two. And we have lunch. We don't critique each other. We just talk about our projects. And then we might, you know, pass on resources and things like that. And there was, this was, so it must be like two years ago. It was before the pandemic we were sitting in one of the restaurants and one of the writers was um, saying, you know, she just hadn't written for a couple of weeks and she just couldn't get to it. Life got in the way, whatever. And then later she said she was really grumpy and kind of down and just, ugh. And I said, I had just read an article or heard about this where creative people, so writers, artists, anybody who creates quilters, anything, um, while they're creating, they do get, they physically get, they can prove this now, a high. And I forget which hormone it's involved, but you do get a high from when you're creating. And if you do it on a regular basis, you keep that high going. But then if, the, if you're not doing it for a week or a couple of weeks, you get withdrawal, you physically get withdrawal which was fascinating. And that's exactly, and we were all like, oh, that explains why I'm so grumpy and you know annoyed with my family or whatever it is. 
it's because I haven't written for five days or whatever. And I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. So I try to do, I don't know, you probably do too, do some creativity every day, whether it's writing new material or just working, doing some research or working on, you know, um, some of my edits that I need to do something every day. And then I feel fulfilled enough that it keeps me going. Yeah. Yeah. My, my family appreciates it too. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Is there anyone else that has a question that you'd like to add in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask uh, Kristen? Well, I guess that's... Uh, Guys are quiet tonight. They're quiet I tonight. All their questions. I know. Well, yeah. <laughs> hopefully we'll, um, we have your books at the library and sure. I'm, it's good to know that you don't have to read those books in order the, so I can read God on Mayhem Street because the first one, Carpe Diem, is already checked out. It's been checked out. So yeah, we can't, awesome. uh, I can't get to that, but that sounds really. Well, and, uh, we should... I think, I don't know if we mentioned this, but the first, both books have won awards. Um, the first mm -hmm. book won the Chicago Writers Association Book of the Year. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. In 2014, which to me is my, that's my most great achievement as far as that book's concerned, because CWA means a lot to me too. But that was just a big thrill. They had a, um, a celebration down in Chicago, and you know, it was it, at the bookstore down there in Lincoln Square, and we got to read it from our store, our books, and then you know, people bought books, and it was really, really wonderful. Yeah, um, yeah, and and you know, because I've self-published them, that also was nice accolades, saying yes, your writing is is really good. It's you know, it's it's something else. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I, I did notice that it was it won an yeah. award and I didn't say that. So I, I should have. Yeah, that I mean, I'm glad we got that in there. Yeah, stuck <laughs> it in there at the last minute. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah. oh, go ahead, Vicki. I wanted to ask a question, but you, uh, you kind of started it, but you didn't finish. You said your other books, you plan to pub self publish and you would tell us what? Could you tell us why? Sure. So, um, are, you, are you a writer? No. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm a so, writer. I'm going to get those books right away. Yeah. As quickly as I can, I'll try to explain the whole publishing process. Um, so, when you write a novel, you can't just send the manuscript to the publisher like Random House. They will not look at it. You have to have a literary agent represent you, and then they approach Random House. So you have to get a literary agent. There's um, a variety of ways you can do that, even more now than when my first book came out. And one of them is to go to a conference and actually pitch your book to an agent and meet them in person. And another way is to send out what's called a query letter, which is a special kind of letter that you would write that includes a synopsis of your book. Um, so with the first book, I did that, um, both things. Um, and I actually met a small press publisher in Chicago who was interested and sent her my manuscript. So I had contacted 30 agents and nobody was interested. And at the time they said, you wanna do 30 um, and then maybe regroup and rewrite a little bit and then send another 30. And now they say it's a hundred, you should be sending it to a hundred. So, but to keep, I know, <laughs> because keep in mind, each query takes an hour to an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours to do. So you're a lot of hours away from writing to query people because you have to do a lot of research and everything. Um, so anyway, I had some, I had gotten 30 rejections and I um, knew that I had heard this and I think it's still true today. So it might take you a day or a week or months or years to get an agent. And then once the agent gets the book, it might take her a year or a couple months or a week, but it might take some time for her to sell the book to a publisher. And then once the publisher gets the book, from the time they sign the contract to the time the book is on the shelf, it's another 18 months on average. So you're talking four or five, six years before the book is actually in your hands. And I was just too impatient for that. Um, and at the time, I, I was at, at working at the Writers Institute in Madison, and we had a panel discussion of local press publishers, and I moderated the panel, and one of the panelists was Kristen Mitchell of Little Creek Press, and I had seen her cover before, it's the book is Spoke, um, and I just thought it was absolutely a beautiful cover, and she was a graphic artist before she started her publishing company, so she's an artist by trade, and I thought, if I publish, self-publish, I will go through her. 
And so then we talked, I got to know a little bit about what she would do. And so I hired her to publish my books for me because I didn't know anything about it. And I, I wanted it to, to, you know, to be the best it could be. Um, her services, um, and a lot, of, a lot of companies have since sprung up, you can hire her to do a variety of services, just the cover if you want or anything like that. Um, but I was really happy with the way the books turned out. Uh, I, I, at this point, this, uh, this story is a young adult dystopian and it's high, con they call it high concept, this whole idea of evil being contained and you know, all that. Um, and it fits the genre really well. So that it has a lot of potential as far as an agent or a publishing house would see. And I have, um, I've contacted, I've talked to a couple of agents, I've contacted 18. And several of them better than the last time have said, um, we're not interested in this project, but we like your writing, send us the next project. So that's a huge thing for me, um, you know, as a writer that I know their writing is good. They just, for whatever reason, they're, they're selling the same story or they're not interested in that kind of whatever, aren't interested. And I got to thinking, I think I can do this myself. Um, I don't want to have to wait again for years. I, when you self-publish, you own it all. So I get to select the cover. I get to select the title. I get to figure out, you know, how it's marketed, all of that. Mm -hmm. If I give it over to a publisher, they might totally change the cover. They might change the title. They might want me to rewrite it in a style that they want. Um, and they might change the story a bit. And I love this story. So I don't want to give up any of that. There's the story of the book, The Help. Do you know, have you read The Help or seen the movie? Mm -hmm. um, the act, the um, author didn't like, she, she said, I don't care what you do with the cover of this, but I, they originally had uh, an adult um, black woman's hand and a, a child, a white child's hand holding hands because it, the help is, you know, the, the governess, the, the, the ladies there take care of the kids um, in the 1960s. And it was a beautiful cover and she loved it. And they said, no, we're gonna change that. She said, okay, you change it, but I don't like birds and I don't like the color purple. I think it's yellow or purple. And so if you look at the, co the cover of Help, it is, a, there's like a power line with birds on it and it's got a background that's like yellow and, and purple. It's exactly, and it has nothing to do with the book, whereas the other one makes complete sense, right? So you have no power over that. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I'm getting to the point in my life where it's like, damn it, I want to do it the way I want it to be. Um, the problem, of course, is I don't get any money up front. I don't get any royalties and I have to foot the bill. And well, for my first two books, I spent a lot of money on them because I really wanted them in hand. Um, these books, I'm getting to know more about publishing through Amazon. A lot of my friends have done that successfully and they're young adult books. So that audience is more in tune to the Kindles and things like that. Um, so I think I can do, um, you know, better marketing that way. Um, so I'm 90% sure that's the way I'm going to go. Um, we'll see. Yeah. But then yeah. it's in the timeline and everything. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, uh, there's also a lot of authors now have their own bookstores. And I think, um, I know Louise Erdrich has a bookstore in uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul and, um, is it Ann Patchett? I, I think he has one in in Nashville, yeah. and and a, and a room of one's own or booked for murder. So these are bookstores that I think really do try to market self publishers and um, and authors that don't get the the press and the the recognition from these huge publishing houses. Which Mystery is, to me is awesome in Madison. If you yeah. haven't been there, I recommend it. And they are great for self-published authors. Yeah. They always have author events. Well, they do. Hopefully they'll have them again. Yeah. Um, author events, author slams. I've done a lot with, you know, book release parties there and stuff. And Joanne is just amazing to work with. Yeah. Good to know. I, I actually have never been there. So I, I oh, should, you should go. You head should over go. there. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you for the plug. Oh, Patty, you have to go. I know you've <laughs> I've been there many, many, many times. Yeah. And what you were saying about um, publishers trying to change your books, we've heard that from many authors, even ones that we've had here at the library. And on author um, interviews that I've watched on, on Zoom or uh, YouTube or whatever, that's common. They want to change the ending. And if you don't want to change it, you know, 
uh, it's, I don't know, I, I really feel for authors who want their genuine um, product. Uh, yes, yes. Right. Well, the other thing which I didn't mention is the money. So I, of course, you know, minus my costs, I get all the money, right? I get everything. Yeah. If I go through a traditional publisher, I get, my agent gets 15% of that. And I think, I forget how much it is. I get like 15% of the profits of, I mean, I get such a small amount and used to be, you know, I was here, oh, but they do all the marketing and they do. No, that's only if you're Stephen King or John Grisham or, you know, somebody that's a big name, Elizabeth Gilbert, somebody like that. But for somebody like me who's coming in new and they, I'm an unknown quantity, they don't know if I can sell books, they're not going to put, they might give me a publicist and they might give me about $5,000 for my website or something like that. But I still have to do all my own marketing. I have to, what I'm already doing mm -hmm. um, and I don't get the money for it. So, you know, it's, there's just... And maybe you should have a traditional author on here um, to talk about the plus side of it. <laughs> I, you know, I've also known authors who have gone traditionally published. And then what happens is the, the agent leaves the publishing house. So yeah. they've spent all this time working with that one agent. And now that agent or that editor doesn't want to, isn't in, invested in the story. And so then that's another problem. Um, I just, I don't really see any upside to it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a niche that, um... That, that writers have found. They found self-publishing you know, self small companies that are willing to you know, work with authors that on, on a personal basis that will work with them to create this product, I mean, that they want, the product that they, and I think that happens in the music industry too right now. People I think are, so too, yeah. yeah. And of course you have to be careful as you would with anything that there's a lot of people out there that just want to rip you off. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So, you know, you've got to do your research and you've got to talk to people who've used that, you yeah. know, company before, but yeah. Well, well, thank you that you are just a wealth of knowledge, not <laughs> only about your stories, what comes through your imagination, but also just your network and your, and your, um, you know, the, the people that you know in the business. So we really uh, thank you so much for, for coming and sharing your knowledge with us. And um, this, this program is recorded, so it will be on our website. And uh, I don't know, maybe a couple months, but thank you so much, Kristen, for thank coming. You, Patty. Yeah. yeah. Look you forward so to it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Happy spring. <laughs> Yay, spring. Yay, it's right. 71 this weekend. Yay. Yes, I know. Yep. All right. Bye.